so before going on with the semaphores a few people ask similar type of questions i believe <coughs> i believe ilhan answered uh, these questions but i still get these questions about uh, homework what should i do uh, especially people are asking about this um this um shell.c so shell.c is shell.c is um is a c program as usual okay uh, uh, and you will write a shell uh, uh, application for your uh, uh, spim system and this will run like an asm so the first three programs that you're gonna write are the assembly uh, uh, files that you that you will have to implement by your hand but the fourth one is a c program so c programs don't run on top of okay spim os spim os needs an uh, mips program right an assembly program like fork and display or something else whatever it is okay so what are you gonna do as i as i as we say in the explanation you need to compile this shell.c into a shell.c into an assembly program so how do you do that uh, you are going to use a mips compiler so the the choice is yours what kind of mips compiler you use there are many compilers around the around the web one of them is i think i have suggested this to a few people i think one of them is one of them is this compiler explorer this one when you go there this compiler explorer okay i just pasted its address to the chat section okay uh, you could you could start any kind of any kind of let me start with an empty one okay this is empty now i am adding a source editor i added a source editor so this is a c c it's a c plus plus source oh, c plus plus is okay yes um or maybe i can do a c okay let me make a c okay c is okay let me close the other one and let me add a compiler to this okay so i added a compiler this is a gcc intel compiler i am going to change it to i am going to change it to a mips compiler let me find the mips compilers where are the mips compilers these are the risk ones you just passed it it is above is it is it is it sorted by the letters yeah here it is okay here's a mips compiler so this one this one um, uh, as you see compiled version of this program so you are write your uh, shell.c compile into a mips code of course shell.c is not by itself is not enough okay is not uh, powerful enough uh, to write your shell you need to make some uh, additions to your uh, system so for that maybe you could call your you could call your uh, uh, shell dot asm file uh, functions or whatever you are calling them okay so what i'm asking is that you write your c shell okay what i'm asking you write your c shell okay shell dot c here and get your code and then uh, modify make your modification on that shell dot asm and submit it okay that's it of course you need to be very careful about this for example if i were you i would use like things like and include 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 stuff here like includes something something of course it will not compile now because i don't have that file but when you do the inclusion thing it's going to include your assembly code into your c code for example or how do you how to add 
assembly in C code. If you like to add your assembly in your C code, okay, you could use this one. ASM. Of course, these are all <clears throat> these are all uh, followed by uh, these are all compiler dependent. But let's see if if this one works here. Wait, by the way, there are a couple of mips in the Well, this one didn't work. Just find the find the compiler find the compiler uh, directives to include an assembly in your compiler environment, whatever, or 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 do your own processing. For example, put your special like my include statement in here. Okay, then replace those my includes with your assembly files and etc. The, I don't know what you are saying, Mohammed. I didn't hear you. Did you ask a question? Yes, I did. What is I your was, question? I was in mute then. Uh, it says MIPS 64 A E N. Uh, which one should, should we choose? I think there is a couple of choices uh, in the uh, editor. MIPS 64, MIPS, MIPS 64, something else. Yeah. On the left hand side. When we say when we do compiler, which one should we choose? I didn't tell you what compiler to use. I said that there are many compilers and choose one compiler. Okay. In the SPIM instructions, there are many options for your compilers. Okay. If the compiler doesn't work perfectly, then you make your modifications on the produce code. Of course, you cannot write this, 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 this homework purely in C. You have to make modifications. Okay, so whatever I wrote in, in uh, step number four, okay, the, all the information is there. I didn't tell you write this, uh, use this compiler, that compiler, that compiler. So it was the first compiler that I see from the web. And uh, I, 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 I saw there are MIPS compilers there, yeah, then that's fine. Okay, any other questions? I think I answered somebody wrong yesterday. Somebody was telling me that should we print all the numbers and print prime next to the number? Okay. So the, 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 the sentence is clear actually. It says that prints all integers, okay, it should be integers, from zero to a thousand on the screen. So it's going to print all the integers. Okay, and if the if the integers are prime, then just prime next to that number. Okay, any other questions? Hayrettin, what is your question? Hayrettin, we don't hear you. I think you don't have a question. Okay. Elektrikli de var herhalde. So for the bubble sort your code we sort the given integers in increasing order by implementing selection sort. So it should be a bubble sort algorithm, of course. I, I think the, this has changed. Yeah, okay. Given integers means that the integers are given by the user, right? You are going to read them. So what is the due date? What is the due date? Oh, today it is today. Okay. So operating system coding is always done. 
this way yeah you write your most of your code in c but you need to make modifications or you need to make some additions okay and you need to find ways of including those assembly code in your c code or uh, find some tricks of your own and i don't suggest you uh, i don't suggest you uh, make directly modifications to your assembly code because uh, you will end up you will end up uh, uh, having an assembly code that you forget how you produced so try to be more systematic try to be more automatic okay Oh, so Hayrettin still you I we cannot hear you. You said something. Okay, if there are no questions, then I am going back to my slides. Okay. So what how do you add this? How do you add this to, where is it? Okay, where is it? This is inline assembly, no. So this is Microsoft inline assembly. How about GCC? Yeah, okay. GCC. Okay. So it is ASM underscore underscore is that I forgot Okay, maybe the best way is just using include. Okay. Okay, by, by include, I mean uh, you are going to include in your assembly. Okay, you understand what I mean? You are going to include in assembly. Okay, so... Uh, sure, I didn't get my microphone to uh, work before, sorry. Um, can I ask my question now? Hi, Hayrettin, are you asking a question? We, we don't hear you, Hayrettin. Could you, could, can you hear me right now, sir? Yes. Okay. So, um, in shell.c file, we are just going to write the write our um, shell in C, then we will compile it, but we won't use shell.c for anything else. We will use the compiled assembly file for the shell. Yeah. So we will just send it to you, but after compiling it to assembly, we can make changes because um, some stuff maybe I cannot do in C, but I can do it in assembly. That's exactly what I said, yes. Compile your shell.c into shell.asm and make modification on your assembly file, but try to find ways of making these modifications automatically. You could use a C preprocessor okay to include your assemblies or you could you could for example uh, make calls in your uh, um, uh, c shell.c uh, uh, into some function that you did not define yet and your definition might come in your assembly etc all right okay so i don't know where you got that idea okay uh, that you, your shell.c should work with the uh, spim uh, so your shell.c should produce an uh, executable uh, linux file no i never said that as as the as the homework says that okay you are going to you are going to you are going to compile it with a mips compiler okay So Ilhan says that to be given extensions. Ilhan, I don't see any reason for giving extensions because I am not saying anything different than 
what I have written what I have written in this homework and if, I, if somebody wants to submit it late you have always your late period you know the rules Can you, can you please like explain how do you envision us embedding uh, C code into assembly? Or because I have looked into how we can compile C using assembly or how we can, uh, because in assembly x86, you can call C functions using uh, assembly, but. Okay, you could, you could, you could do this f7 okay something like that or you could you could for example this is f7 right and this is your function f here and it takes an integer okay and you write this you write this okay this one and you write this if I can find the curly brackets, yeah, I found it. Okay, good. So your function f is here, right? I am not going to write anything in here. Okay, I am not going to write anything in this f, but my function, uh, my my square function called this f. <coughs> so if I am calling an assembly function. I would replace this code here on the left with my assembly one either manually or using some kind of a trick search and replace and etc now the thing is we are not calling assembly from c we are calling c from assembly or this is what you are requiring us to do no, i never said that to call c from assembly where does it say it the assembly should, the assembly the spin should compile the c code Note that shell C is a C program which needs to be compiled by the MIPS compiler. Okay, what, is that what you mean? Isn't that what you said? That C code will be compiled. Are you are you reading what I am reading? I cannot. What exactly you are reading at this moment? You don't you don't see my screen. I see your screen and you have some highlighted. So highlighted, read the highlighted sentence. Shell C is a program which needs to be compiled by a MIPS compiler. Okay. When you compile it with a MIPS compiler, what do you get? An assembly file. So I actually, I don't care if you write a C program, very large C program, or a very small one, at the end, you are gonna give me a shell.asm, right? Shell.asm is a file that you have produced from shell.c and you modify it later, okay? You can modify the way you want. So we can just give you shell.asm without using shell.c, right? Is that, is that what you exactly want from us? Say that again. So what you require us to do is to write a C code that gets compiled into a MIPS code using some MIPS version of GCC, and then we will change that file and run it using uh, spin uh, run it using spin is that is that correct yes so we can just skip skip the c part right like why, why bother with the c part if we can directly write assembly Shell. Well, I am trying to make it easy for you because writing the whole shell in a sh assembly is difficult. Uh, all right. 
I think I have misunderstood that because I have I have embedded the C file in the uh, in the spin. So that, that that's what I thought that we will do. Whatever you are gonna make in SIPIM will be will be will be done in these two programs, system called CPP and system called H. If you are going to make any changes, it will be in these two files. Okay. Yes, Sami Batuan, what you are doing is is acceptable. That's what I said. Don't expect the compiler to produce a perfect code for you. Okay, if you don't like this compiler, just try to use some other compilers or as I said, no, it's not going to be perfect fit uh, for your needs. You need to make changes. That's the life of the operating system designer or the programmer. Okay. That data and that uh, that text sections is not difficult to add. You just write some extra uh, uh, Unix scripting uh, steps. That's it. I don't understand why you guys are so confused. I mean, this is something straightforward. You just shell that C, compile and modify. I mean, I I don't know why it is so difficult to understand it in a different way. Anyway, that's your problem, okay? You are third year computer engineering students are, and you are supposed to be smart enough to handle this. Okay. Um, so uh, producer consumer semaphores, we, we did that already. Remember, we have a mutex here, a mutex here, and then two semaphores. Semaphore means that it's a, just a integer counting, okay? And uh, there is only one way for a semaphore to uh, suspend or to, to be blocked. It is the down semaphore. If it is zero, you cannot decrement it, okay? It's, if empty is zero, you cannot decrement it. You have to wait uh, uh, until empty becomes uh, non-zero. Okay, in that case, you can decrement it. So you have to be you have to be blocked here or there. So there are possibly okay one, two, three, four places to be blocked. And uh, when do you when do you when do you unblock those? Okay, one, two. Oh no, let, let me do it this way. Okay. One could be unblocked here, one, right? Or, no, it's not correct, no, 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 no. One could be empty and down empty and, yeah, that's true, here. Down mutex, up mutex, here. Down full, up full, three is here, and four is here. So. When you are writing these kind of programs, you need to be careful about there should be, for each down, there should be an up somewhere. Otherwise, otherwise, what would happen? If my code doesn't include any down mutex statements, if my code, okay, I have written a, a multi-threaded code, I, I have used many ups but no downs. What would be the result? No blocking at all. No blocking at all. That means that no synchronization, right? Nobody is waiting for anybody else. There would be probably there would be probably race conditions. Just the opposite. There are there are all downs and no ups. Then it means that you just block and uh, uh, don't don't come back. Nobody is going to wake you up. Okay, so uh, there are two types of semaphores, we say, as we said, okay. Uh, counting semaphores, okay. 
Uh, you just count it down to zero. When you reach the zero, you block. You wait, you sleep until uh, somebody makes that counter. Now zero increments it. Okay. And there are mutex, mutual exclusion semaphores. Okay. So these are for used for uh, entering and leaving the critical regions. Okay. Entering and leaving the critical regions. In this case, this is the mutex for critical region lock. And these two are for the semaphores, counting the empty slots and the full slots. Okay, so for a special case of semaphore, the, the mutexes, only uh, a single bit is enough to, to keep it. Okay, uh, and mutexes are supported by the operating systems, as, as we said before. And these are the implementations that I showed you last uh, time. Okay. So this one calls thread yield when it is blocked. Okay, so the idea is this, okay? Um, if we have more than one threads, inter-process communication between the threads are easy. Why? Because they are already sharing the same memory space. Okay, they're already sharing the uh, memory space. But, but what if I have two processes? Processes do not share the same uh, address space. Processes do not share the same address space. And then uh, what are you going to do? Uh, you cannot do such a thing. Okay, you cannot say, okay, TSR registered mutex. Why? Because mutex is a memory location. Only one process can see it. The other one is not going to see it. If I am locked on this one, the other one cannot unlock it, etc. So what are you going to do? The solution is this, okay? You ask the operating system to run the mutex for you, okay? So the mutexes or the semaphores are kept by the operating system and they are, they are part of the operating system's task and they are considered as resources, okay? You tell the operating system, give me a mutex, give me five semaphores, I am going to increment them or decrement them and I am going to share these semaphores and mutexes with these processes. Okay. So they are kind of sharing the memory space of the kernel in a controlled way. Okay. So many operating systems offer a way of uh, sharing some portion of their address space with other processes. Okay. Uh, as we said before, as we said before, okay, we like this. This is a, a, a spin lock again. There is a spin going on. It's kind of a slow spin. Why? Because at every spin you are telling, let's say we are doing the kernel level threads. At every, uh, at every uh, spin you are calling a operating system level uh, uh, function, thread yield, okay? And that thread yield waits until you get your turn. So it doesn't waste uh, so much CPU time, but thread yield is an operating system call, okay? As I said, uh, we assume that threads are handled by the operating system or the kernel level threads, okay? so. Thread yield uh, is an operating system call. That means that it's a context switch. And context switch is not, as we said before, context switch is not uh, cheap. So the question is this, should we, should we, should we take this uh, busy waiting approach without this call? Okay, without this call, I can make the busy waiting. Or should we do the operating system call? Okay, both of them have the disadvantages. One of them is wasting CPU time by running the same loop over and over again. The other one is doing the context switch. So they found a solution, kind of a solution. They call this a fast user space mutex, futex. Okay, so busy wait or block, which is faster. The idea is this, run your spin lock a few times, okay. Usually you give, you would get the lock because the critical regions are not that large, okay? When you get your lock, you will continue. 
So this way, you are not going to make any, you are not going to make any uh, system calls. But if it is taking too much time, then you you have no choice but uh, blocking yourself uh, and going to the operating system. Okay, so I am not going to talk much about this details of it, but that's the idea. I mean, you don't do, you don't you don't do this uh, calling call thread yield in a blind way. Okay, you do it in a smart way, and most of the time you handle your uh, you handle your uh, mutexes in your user space without asking anything from the operating system. Okay, so these are the pthread library function calls for the mutexes. Okay, you are going to see details of this in your systems programming course. Okay, so this is like uh, thread, right? Initialization of the mutex structure, destroy, destroying, destroying of the uh, destruction of the uh, mutex structure, locking, unlocking the mutex structure, and there is this try lock. Okay, you say that I need to get this mutex lock. If I get this, I will be fine. If I don't get it, okay, don't block me. I will do something else. So this will not block. It will try to get the lock. If it gets, it will be successful. If it doesn't get it, it will not be locked. This one is going to get you the lock, okay, or block. At the end of this function call, you will definitely have your lock. It is either some locking, uh, blocking period, okay, or directly you will get the lock. So these are two things. Uh, maybe you can implement your futex using this try lock thing. So run this try lock block, maybe, hundred times for a second okay if it works then you get it otherwise you are going to do this lock okay good any questions so far about mutexes and the semaphores Okay, if there are no questions, then I will continue then. Condition variables. You might think that, you might think that I am fine with this uh, producer-consumer problem using the mutexes and the semaphores. So these are good for, um, I mean, any kind of communication between two threads or processes could be handled using this mechanism. Okay, if you have a problem like this, always start with this code and you will be fine. But sometimes my conditions, my conditions for blocking, okay, my conditions for blocking are not on numbers. In this case, for example, if full becomes zero, I am blocked. If empty becomes zero, I am blocked, right? So the only way for blocking is some number becoming zero. So that's the condition. For the mutex, again, if it is zero, I am blocked. Sometimes I need different conditions. For example, if this variable and this variable is same, then block me, etc. Okay. If they are not equal, if they are equal now, then then wake me up, etc. So you need different conditions. For that, they have developed they have developed condition variables. Okay. Uh, second synchronization mechanism other than the semaphores and mutexes, condition variables. Okay, mutexes are good. Okay, we use them for entering the critical the critical regions. That's good. Okay, and semaphores are good for counting the empty buffers or the full buffers and etc. Okay, condition variables allow us to block due to some condition not being met. That condition doesn't have to be counting. Okay. And we use condition variables with the mutexes all the time. Okay, it's like you don't use the semaphores by themselves. You use the semaphores with the mutexes. You lock the critical region. You do your semaphores and then you do your semaphores and then um, and then uh, 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 you do you do you do whatever you need to do and you unlock stuff okay 
So like we are using our mutexes and semaphores together, we are going to use the uh, mutexes and the condition variables together. Okay, so I am going to show you some code. It will be similar to this one. Okay, it will be similar to this one. I will have mutexes. I will have mutexes, but I don't have semaphores. Instead of semaphores, I will have condition variables. Okay. Maybe I should ask you a question here. What happens if I replace if I replace these two if if I replace these two lines and if I replace these two lines again like that and like that. So I am replacing those four sets of lines. Would this work? So first I am getting the mutex, I am entering the critical region, I am downing the empty semaphore and continuing that way. Would this work? If consumer if, if consumer gets the mutex, and if it's try to decrement full, if the full is zero, then it's going to be blocked in inside the critical region, right? If you are blocked inside the critical region, this one cannot enter the critical region, so it cannot up full, right? So that, that's a bad decision then. Okay, so this order is nice. Okay, just the opposite order is not good. Okay, you don't take the mutex uh, in your hand and uh, uh, you lock yourself, you block yourself there. Since you are blocked, uh, nobody can enter the critical region. That's not a good idea. So we are going to come to this when we do the, when we do the condition variables. Okay, so condition variables, as we said, mutexes and condition variables are used together. And these are very similar, actually. Uh, condition variable initialization, condition variable destruction, pthread library again. Okay. I am saying that I am going to wait until this condition is satisfied. Okay. I am going to block waiting for the signal. This one says that condition is satisfied. Wake up anybody who is waiting for this condition. Okay. I, what is the condition? We don't know the condition. Condition depends on your program. It is not like a, the number becoming a zero. So you might say that, you might say that mutexes and um, semaphores are kind of special versions of condition variables. Because in that case, the condition is a number is non-zero. Okay, and this broadcast is signal multiple threads and wake all of them. Okay, that there, there, there doesn't need to be a single uh, blocked process or signal. There might be more than one and uh, uh, unblock all of them. Okay, here is the consumer, producer consumer uh, uh, problem again, using the condition variables. Let's start from the global variable declarations. Of course, pthread, there is a large number. I have pthread mutex, the mutex, there is one mutex for the critical region. And I have two condition variables. Condition C, consumer, and condition P, producer. Producer, consumer, two. Um, conditions like the uh, uh, full uh, semaphore and the empty semaphore and um, my buffer is initially zero I am going to use this as a buffer between the producers and the consumers okay let's look at the main function this is the main function main function says that 
I have two threads, producer and consumer. Okay. Remember, I had a single mutex. I initialized it. I initialized two conditions, one mutex, two conditions, condition variables. And I create two threads. One is a producer thread. The other one is a consumer thread. Okay. Consumer and producer are the names of the functions, of course. Producer and consumer here. Okay. So I pass their pointers, function pointers to this function along with the addresses of these uh, uh, two uh, uh, thread structures. And I wait until they are done. And I destroy all of my uh, uh, mutexes and the condition variables. So let's look at the let's look at the uh, thread thread code producer and consumer. First, the producer. Let me do it this way. So there is a very large loop from one to one trillion, whatever it is, very large number. Okay, I run this loop. At the end, I kill my thread. Okay, and consumer is doing the same thing. Very large loop. At the end, I kill the thread. Okay, at the top of the loop, I get the lock. Okay, p thread mutex lock, the mutex. At the bottom, I release it. So this is my critical region. And the same thing is here, critical region. And they are, they are locking the same uh, mutex. They are running the same mutex. They are unlocking the same mutex. Okay. And here is uh, my condition. I am saying that my condition is buffer is not zero. If buffer is not zero, I have to wait. I am going to block. Okay. So that's that's my condition. You could have said I could have done this with the mutex, etc. Well, well, I mean, that's true, but just to make the condition a, a little bit simpler, this is what I did. If buffer is not zero, that means that somebody had written to it. Somebody had written to it. And I need to wait until buffer becomes available. It becomes zero. So I am saying that p thread condition wait and uh, uh, p condition p. Producer condition. I am waiting that condition to be satisfied, that condition to be signaled. Okay. But then there is the second parameter to this function, the mutex. I am sending the, the this, this this parameter to this p thread condition weight function. Why, why do I do that? Previously in my case, I didn't do such a thing. Remember my producer consumer problem using the mutexes and the semaphores? I down the semaphore, then I get the mutex, then I didn't do anything like that. Okay, semaphore and mutex didn't know each other. I mean, it, it was me that doing the uh, uh, downing the mutex and the getting the downing the semaphores. Now, for the condition variable, I am sending the condition, of course condition variable. I mean, I, I said that I am going to wait until this is satisfied. Also, I am sending the address of the mutex too to this p thread condition wait. Can anybody tell me why? Just a small hint. What? Remember what? the question that I asked just before? Okay, Usama, you, you, you are telling so it me. Won't block. If, if one of us and the other didn't, so it won't waste time on the scenario. Say that again, I did not understand what you said. So it won't waste time on a scenario when one condition is satisfied and the other isn't. Both of them are satisfied at the same time, so it would check them atomically at the same time. And well, I already, I already checked the mutex is satisfied. If the mutex is not satisfied, if I didn't get the mutex, I would be blocked at this line. I definitely yeah, know that. Mutex is, mutex is okay. I got the mutex. What I'm...
I mean, if I am at this line, I know that the mutex is okay. I know its value. It is non-zero. It is it is it is non-zero now. It is available. And I am in the I am in the. I got the mutex. I am in the critical region. I have the right to be in the critical region. So why this condition weight has to know about the mutex? Okay, keep this question in mind, and we will come back to this one later. I said that. If buffer is not zero, I have to wait. But if buffer is zero, then it is available, then I write to it. Okay, when I write to this buffer, I say that whoever is waiting for, for this condition variable, condition C, can now unblock and continue because the buffer is available to read. So this one is waiting for condition P, this one is sending a signal for condition C for the consumer, okay? If the consumer is waiting for condition C here, see this one. So the the consumer is consumer is waiting for the uh, uh, condition C here. So I am signaling it. I am signaling so that they can wake up and they can continue. And I release my mutex, and this goes like that. Let's look at the consumer again. Let's use the, now let's look at the consumer, sorry. Again, I lock the mutex. I release it here. So this is my critical region. If buffer is zero, that means that it is empty. I cannot read it. Okay, I cannot read it. So in that case, if buffer is zero, then I am going to be locked. I, I will say that I am going to wait this condition C. Again, I am doing something similar, like that, okay? Uh, I, I am blocked here if buffer is zero, and I will not leave this loop until buffer becomes non-zero. When buffer becomes non-zero with such a statement, in that case, I read that buffer and I, I, I assign a zero to that buffer, and I send a signal to the producer saying that buffer is now av available to write. So if this one is blocked there, it will wake it up. Okay, so that's it. So let's 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 come back to my question again. Why p thread condition weight needs two parameters? And p thread condition signal doesn't need two parameters. <laughs> Again, I am, I am repeating the same thing. Remember my question I asked before I started talking about the condition variables. I ask about you, I ask you about the, let me go there. If you don't remember, this will help you remember. What did I ask in this slide? I asked you about the order of those mutexes and the uh, semaphores, right? I said that mutex should come first. Or I should I said that semaphore should come first. First down the semaphore, then you go into the critical region. Okay, down the semaphore, then you go to the critical region. In this case, in this case, okay, it is just the opposite. Okay. So the question they ask you is related to the question I am asking you right now. How come I have two parameters to this p thread condition weight? Function.
Nobody? Usama, this, this is your question. You answered me before you can now answer right. it now. Yes. Well, my, my, my previous guess was that if we have, like, if we are waiting on two semaphores, uh, we won't have problems with aligning them or putting them in a specific order. It would just get them at the same time. Well, I mean, the, the, the order is important. Why? Because, because this. I get the mutex. If I don't get the mutex, I am blocked here. How about here? I am here if I am blocked. What would happen if I am blocked at this line? What is the condition to be blocked in that line? What is the condition for that, uh, for that line to be blocked? The consumer gets the next line. Galip, can you say it again? The consumer gets the lock. The consumer gets the lock. Well, no, we get the lock. Sorry. We get the lock here, mutex. Okay, we got the mutex. The only condition for this line to be blocked is what? The only condition for this, for this line to be blocked is buffer is not zero, right? Buffer is something else. Buffer is not zero. If buffer is not zero, then I am going to be blocked. So do you see the problem now? If buffer is not zero, I am going to be blocked. So what? So how am, going, how am I going to unblock? Somebody has to condition uh, signal me, this one, right? Somebody has to run me, but this cannot run. Why? Because the other one is blocked. Because the other one has the mutex. The other one is in the critical region and it is locked. Exact, uh, the exact, okay, the exact reason why we shouldn't have switched the uh, lines in the previous case. Okay, so by sending this mutex to this p thread condition weight, I am saying that if you are blocked, then release the mutex. So this function, this function, okay, Sardar, is this is this your camera? Do you, do you guys see my screen or Sardar's? I see your screen. I I see Sardar's uh, camera. I guess. Let me try to cut my and send it again. Do you guys see my screen? Yes, we do. Yes, sir. No, I see it. Okay, as long as you see it, I am fine. Okay, so uh, the, the, the meaning for this function is, okay, if the condition, if the, if the, if the, if the condition, I am going to block on this condition, okay, but I am in the critical region, so while I am blocked, release the mutex so that the other process can enter the critical region. If I am if I am getting the if I am getting the signal, then I can continue from this point because I have both the condition and the mutex now. That's the reason this one gets two parameters. Okay. You you understand now? Did you guys understand it? So conveyed also release the mutex. It has to. 
Otherwise, if I don't release the mutex, the other one cannot enter the critical region. Oh, okay. Okay? Some, um, something wrong with you guys this morning for some reason. I mean, this, this, is not, this is not a very difficult thing. I don't know what's going on, but so that's the, that's the reason I have it. Okay? That's the reason I have it. Okay, so why didn't they why didn't they choose it the other way? I mean, replace these two lines, and I don't have the same problem. Remember, I am talking about the buffer here, and buffer has to be handled inside the critical region. Buffer has to be handled inside the critical region. So I cannot do this outside the critical region. I have to be in the critical region. Previously, previously, okay, I was dealing with the semaphores and the mutexes. They are all in the kernel space, and there is no problem with the modifications of those because uh, when you decrement a semaphore or mutex, okay, you are already doing this in a indivisible way that's guaranteed by the hardware and operating system. Okay, so I have to, I have to, I have to develop this solution. Yes. Does secret conduit? Uh, what? Okay. We, we go in a while loop, so we, we release the mutex, but then we go back to it again, or like we have to lock it back again, right? Afterwards, the secret conduit lock the mutex again. If buffer is not zero, I am saying that I am going to wait until somebody signals me this condition, condition P. And that mm -hmm. will only happen at this line when buffer is zero. So when somebody when somebody signals that do I do I take mutex as well? Do I lock mutex? Sure, yeah, otherwise how are you gonna continue? Yes. They they okay, they condition you, okay. They send a signal to you. And then it releases the mutex. Now you can continue. Now you have both of them. Because he, here's the thing. So in, in the consumer, P thread signal, it signals the cons P, but it doesn't re release the mu mutex. It, re it, it releases consumer, mutex here, see? After the condition signal, you release the mutex. So this one has the yeah, signal okay, and the mutex and can continue now. Let's let's assume that it uh, it didn't uh, it, the buffer wasn't zero, so the consumer continued working. Yeah. Uh, so the consumer then signaled the cons p. Uh huh. But then uh, context switch happened with before p thread mutex unlock. Then this thing cannot continue. This has to wait, and that's why this is in this loop. Yeah. The, sorry. 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 The, con, the, the buffer the, is zero, but the mutex buffer mutex is, is is yeah. Buffer is blocked. zero, but this function is still blocked. Why? Because it has the signal, but it doesn't have the mutex. That's why you are sending. Okay. So, okay, so it needs both. It needs the mutex to be unlocked and the signal and like the condition to be signaled, right? Yeah, that's why it needs both parameters. Okay, I see. Okay. The one reason is you need to release the mutex. The second one is to be able to continue to be in the critical section, you need to get the mutex. Okay. Uh, let's take 10 minutes of break and try to wake up in the meanwhile get some coffee or something somebody else has to answer my questions other than Osama okay let's be here around 11.34 
okay so uh, this is how you use the condition variables as I said before condition variables are like semaphores but the condition to block on is defined by you in this case I am I am waiting for this condition to happen or I am waiting for this condition to happen okay it could be an arbitrary condition it doesn't have to be a sum, of, a sum number becoming zero or not zero okay so uh, the the as you see there are many details of writing these kind of programs the, the programs running in parallel and then programs threads uh, communicating with each other interprocess communication is not easy to write uh, and people realize that they are making lots of mistakes and once you uh, when you when you when you miss one of the uh, required or the important steps of this kind of programming uh, you get very bad uh, results sometimes your program works sometimes it doesn't work because that's the nature of the race conditions right it doesn't happen all the time and the results depend on the order of the switching order of the programming running etc you cannot uh, find the uh, bugs and once you find them you cannot repeat them all the time so it is difficult so to make the life of a multi-thread programming interprocess communication uh, programmers life a little bit easier uh, they invented uh, uh, something a higher level construct which is called monitors okay monitors uh, invented in 1970s okay it's a programming language construct uh, java has it c and c plus plus originally they don't they don't have it okay uh, monitor is like a class is a class okay and only one thread can be executing it at a time you say that inside this class these methods can be executed uh, only by a thread okay so it's like a mutually exclusive execution so the programming language knows about it so your functions are automatically mutually exclusive if one thread is running one of your methods or functions the other ones cannot okay and java has a direct um, a direct uh, 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 support for the uh, monitors okay and uh, uh, as we said before condition variables are good for any kind of condition to block and signal so along with the monitors uh, with the condition variables uh, you can do most of the interprocess communication stuff uh, yourself in these kind of uh, languages okay so they are good for achieving mutual exclusion and you cannot go wrong with the mutual exclusion i mean there is no way that you may reverse the order of these callings because the mutual exclusion is automatically done for you mutual exclusion is automatically done uh, for you you don't have to do it yourself so before you before your method begins uh, since they are all mutually exclusive you have to get the luck otherwise your method doesn't begin and it is satisfied by the compiler of your programming language okay um, so you have the condition variables and you have the mutual exclusiveness automatically then you can do the uh, you can do the interprocess communication so this is the one pseudo examples of a monitor i have a monitor class this producer this consumer okay these are two different uh, functions of the monitor okay this one can be run only by a process this one can be done only by a process if i am running this i cannot run this if i am running this i cannot run that. Uh, that, that that's the that's the idea okay that's the idea so let's see one so, example mm, yeah a question is, is monitor like automatic uh, automatic uh, context switcher between threads or be between sorry between uh, uh, between different processes no, like it no, handles the, the, all the condition that you fixes everything by itself without yeah. the help of exactly it is it is like automatic uh, mutex handler you don't talk about the mutexes anymore you don't talk about the critical sections anymore critical section conditions are satisfied by the 
programming language programming language by itself okay all you deal with is the condition variables okay so critical section is handled by the programming language but you have to design the condition variables you do your signaling you do your weighting yourself and the rest is handled by the programming language okay so um so when do you block when do you when do you uh, not block okay when you try to execute a uh, uh, when you try to call a method if somebody else is using the method then you cannot call that method you have to wait but you don't you don't you don't know about that because that is automatically handled the handling part that the part that you are going to handle is the waiting for the condition and signaling for the conditions okay so let's see an example this is an example pseudo example doesn't include any real programming language since i am running out of time very quickly i don't want to look at this now let me skip to the direct java example okay this is an example producer consumer example in java i have a public class producer consumer still this is not a monitor okay so i have a static final and zero i have a producer and i have a consumer okay producer and consumer producer is this producer is a thread in java this is how you do the threads you extend yourself from a thread base class or super class okay you say that i am a thread and this is the method to run for the thread okay this is my main method public static void main the main method of the whole program say that i have a producer and i have a consumer and i am going to start my producer and consumer now one of them is producing the other one is consuming okay and as you see the producer runs in an infinite loop and consumer is going to do the same thing okay it looks like in an infinite loop producer produces an item and inserts into the monitor okay i have a monitor our monitor so it's this one is going to be our monitor so the mutual exclusion all the signaling everything will be done in this in this reference uh, monitor here so i say that monitor dot insert item so i am in an infinite loop and i am just inserting items and consumer is going to do the just the opposite okay consumer extend thread and nicely nicely consumer says that okay i am going to remove item and i am going to consume it i mean consuming means doesn't mean much i mean you just use that item somewhere so in an infinite loop consume in an infinite loop produce so as you see up to this point up to this point I don't see anything about inter-process communication. I don't see anything about inter-process communication. I didn't say that I should be mutually exclusive. I should be signaling something. Or, so the producer and consumer, they run like regular threads. One of them is producing, the other one is uh, consuming. And of course, all the mutual exclusion and the signaling will be, will be handled inside this method insert and inside this method remove in our special class our monitor our monitor will be our monitor okay let's look at that our monitor class monitor class okay static class our monitor a regular class and i have a integer buffer of size n and how many elements do i have inside the buffer currently zero and this is going to be low and high so it's going to be like that okay there are n elements in it and low is going to point to the low end of the uh, empty side and high is going to 
do this so these elements are full and count is in this case one two three four five five of them is uh, occupied and this is a circular buffer what do i mean by circular buffer high could be high could be lower than low okay high could point here so in this case this is full full and this one is full too so it's a circular buffer okay so the producer producer i guess puts the produced item at the position high and consumer produces from the beginning from low so count low and high are special places that are shared between producer and consumer and the buffer of course so one two three four variables they are shared by these two processes and we need to be careful okay they have to be handled in the they have to be handled in the uh, 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 critical region okay that's one thing the other thing is that somebody has to watch if i have enough space to put my data in so that's a condition also somebody has to watch if i have enough data to consume okay that's going to be another condition okay so insert method insert remember uh, the one that uses that is used by the producer method insert method insert takes an integer and it is trying to insert that number into the buffer as you see synchronized so this is a java java keyboard when you say a function is synchronized that means that only one thread can run that functional method that's how the mutual exclusion is satisfied synchronized keyboard synchronized java keyboard okay so you don't say that this is a monitor class you say the mutual exclusion by putting the synchronized keyword at the beginning of the method so here's the question if we want to have one producer but let's say five consumers for each consumer we have to write a different function what one consume two consume three of course not they can all call the same function or method but only one of them can be inside that method all oh, right right because here it's just a critical sentence section right okay 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 so i didn't i didn't show you the inside of it but only one method can be inside this insert at the same time so this is a mutually exclusive method. It is satisfied by the Java compiler. Okay. So inside insert, as you may expect it, I am going to put this integer into this buffer, increment count by one. And I think I am going to insert it at the high end. I am not sure what you are going to see. Okay. And I'm going to modify all those. I can do this in a safe way because I am in a mutually exclusive area. Okay. So, uh, let's ignore the first line now. Okay. So buffer high is value. So I put at the high value. So I increment high by one. But since I am running a circular, since I am running a circular buffer, okay, I take the module of n, I put it in a high, and I increment count by one. So these three things I have to do, okay? But before doing that, if count is n, then that means that I cannot write anything because the buffer is full. So if count is n, I call this method. I'm going to write it in a few minutes. Here it is, go to sleep. I am going to run this uh, method go to sleep if count is n, okay? I have to be blocked okay if count is one at the end of what i did what does that mean if count is one it means that count was zero and the buffer was empty 
So the consumer must be sleeping on this condition. So I am notifying the consumer. Okay. So notify. What is notify? Where is notify defined in Java? Do you guys remember? In object class. Furkan, say it again. In object class. Yes, exactly. In class object. In class object. In Java. In class object. Uh, there is a there is a method named. By the way, uh, I found this. I found this assembly stuff. Yeah. See, if you like to include in your GCC compiler. This doesn't work for all the compilers. In GCC compiler, if you like to, if you like to uh, include your assembly code, this this is what you do. Okay, move and add. I think I did that. Yeah. Okay. I I I add that. I added that here. So, in my square function source and destination, I think I am moving the so the the zero and one zero and one zero is my R. Zero is my destination and one is my source. So it looks like, yeah, okay, here it is. Move and add is here. So if you like to include some uh, assembly, you could do it this way. Okay, look at it, look at, look at that from the web. I mean, it depends on your compiler, what you are using. With, with the GCC compiler, it is different. With the Microsoft compiler, it is different. So Java object class. When you look at the Java object class, you know all of them, I guess. You know, vehicles, finalize, get class, hash code, okay. Notify, notify all, wait, okay. And there are three overloads of the wait. There is a wait, wait until somebody notifies me. There is another one, wait until some time, okay. And uh, another one uh, uh, that you specify the waiting time in different units. Okay, so Java from the original design supports this inter-process uh, uh, communication and the locking mechanisms from the fundamentals of the fundamentals of the, uh, the 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 language itself. Okay, so if count is n. Okay, if count is n, then I need to go to sleep. What is go to sleep? It says that wait. Okay. Just call that method of object class wait. Okay. And sometimes wait throws this exception, interrupted exception. It is it's a behavior of the Java virtual machine. If it try if it throws it, then you catch it. Okay, you you catch it and you don't do. You don't do anything. You, this is just a guard. Some some behavior that I don't remember why I why we do that. Okay. So basically, so, basically so instead of instead of only. instead of instead of calling go to wait, this could have been just wait go to sleep. Sorry. This could have been just wait, just read it that way, okay? So, Sama, you have a question? Yeah, uh, notify only, like, synchronized, uh, it only behaves within a class. If we have another class, it doesn't have any connection with it, right? Well, notify and wait are running on this object monitor. Where is our monitor? Where is our monitor here? Okay. This is monitor dot notify and monitor dot wait. Okay. Great. So this is our condition. Yeah. Whoever is using this monitor notify, monitor wait, they are communicating with each other. Okay. So if you have more than one monitors, monitor one, monitor two, monitor three. So you can you can you can you can communicate with many different threads using the same monitor. Since this monitor is static inside this producer consumer, 
there is only a single monitor for the whole producer consumer class okay so i cannot have two monitors of the same class of course you can you can say static r monitor monitor one new monitor and static r monitor monitor two new monitor again but they are like exclusive between each other or they are static communicating with each other um inside your monitor okay monitor class synchronized each object i mean in this case i have a single monitor right monitor object right and on that monitor object if i call this insert on that monitor object if i if i call this insert on that object then uh, it is exclusive yes on different objects uh, they are exclusive within themselves but in this case since since these are all static okay since these are all static uh, this call insert doesn't depend on the object because you don't need the uh, object no, no no sorry sorry this is not static right yeah of course yeah okay so what i'm saying is true you may have more than one you may have more than one uh, monitor objects and each of them has their own uh, 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 mutual exclusion mechanism and each of them you may think that each of them has their own insert and uh, remove functions and they are exclusive within each other so different threads could be in the insert methods of different monitors okay okay so uh, so read this as weight if count is and then weight uh, if count is not and then i am i put my values in there and if count is one then i call notify and in uh, remove method is doing just the opposite if count is if I count is zero then i call weight if count is not zero then i remove the value i increment low by one modulo n and decrement count and I call notify whoever is waiting whoever is sleeping on it okay Java has this uh, notify all method where is my notify notify all sometimes uh, if there are multiple producers or multiple consumers so many of them might be waiting on this signal so you call notify all if you know there are there might be more than one thread waiting on it okay good so java is a language that directly supports these monitors as you see i am only dealing with i am only dealing with just a single monitor just a single variable here just this one okay this one weights and signals that's it so that's our condition variable uh, and uh, mutual exclusiveness is supported by the uh, uh, the compiler directly so that makes the life a lot easier because i don't have to think about uh, mutual exclusiveness i don't t t have to think about the uh, mutexes okay any questions about the uh, monitors so what is the disadvantage of the monitor the disadvantage is of course it is language dependent okay but some language some languages do not directly support it okay um, and uh, uh, if they don't support it you have to handle it, everything yourself but if the language supports it then definitely use it again uh, they are they are good for shared memory if you don't have any shared memory between the processes then they will not work like the uh, uh, like the semaphores or the uh, uh, mutexes okay any questions so we looked at the mutexes at the beginning okay we started with the spin locks 
busy waiting, spin locks. Then we said that uh, 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 there are standard ways of doing this stuff, uh, semaphores. Mutexes are the special versions of the semaphores. Then we said that what if we our conditions are more generic than we have the condition variables. Then after that, we looked at the monitors that are directly supported by the by some languages such as Java. Okay, so we we looked at them. So let's 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 talk about the other side of the picture. Now up to now we assume that there is a shared memory space either in the user space or in the kernel space. How about the memory space is not shared? Okay. How about my processes are running on two different machines, uh, 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 each one on the different ends of the world? Okay. So what am I going to do in that case? There is no way that I can share memory between two different computer systems. And I, I have a distributed system. It is connected uh, via a local area network. And the computers are different. And there is no way that I can share memory even in the kernel space. What am I going to do? In this case, most of the time, what I do is message passing. Okay. So message passing is, uh, is a capability provided by the uh, uh, networking libraries. I can send messages and I can receive messages between two processes over a network. Okay. So when, when, when receiver issues this function, it blocks if there is no data available. I don't, I don't get any message. So I am blocked. Sender blocks if the receiver's buffers are full. I am sending something, but the receiver cannot receive, so I am going to be blocked. Of course, there are many questions about what happens to my data if the data is lost, what happens if there are problems with the network and etc. Okay, flow control, error detection, correction, etc. These are all related to networking, okay, and out of the scope of this uh, operating system concept. Okay, in the operating system, if you send some data to the memory, it is written to the memory, you know that, right? And if you are reading some data from the memory, you read it. That's it. You don't, you don't say that if, what if there is a problem when I read my data? You don't, you don't assume that. Even if there is a problem, then you take it as it is. With the network, it is not like that. I mean, you, if you try to read something, you may time out. Your data may be lost. Your data may be hacked. Your data may be altered okay uh, while you are receiving it so you have to you have to you have to take care of all these problems but we will not deal with them okay we will assume that whatever i send it will be sent whatever i receive it will get it will i i will get it from the right source okay so that's the idea of message passing let's see this message uh, uh, passing approaches consumer producer problem with message passing we are going to Resolve N buffers, okay, between the producer and consumer. And send and receive functions are provided to us by the uh, networking libraries and support by the operating system. Okay, this is the producer. Producer says that, okay, an item and a message. I have two local variables. In an infinite loop, I produce an item, okay, this is the producer, remember producer, I produce an item, I receive a message, remember this is a producer but it is receiving message, this is an empty buffer, so it is receiving an empty buffer, okay, I put my message, okay, I put my message into this buffer, I send it. That's how the producer works. That's how the producer works. It gets an empty buffer and it puts the message in it and it sends it. So it is simple. Producer is, uh, consumer is a little bit more complicated. Producer says that at the beginning of the uh, loop, I will send, I will send empty buffers, N of them. And empty buffers. 
at the beginning of the program. Then I will run into a infinite loop. I receive from the producer a message and I extract my item from the message and I send the message back to the producer so that it knows that it's an empty buffer. Okay, and I consume the item and I run this in this, in this, in this infinite loop. So it is not like producer is producing and pushing it, producing and pushing it. Producer and consumer are exchanging their buffers. Okay. Uh, consumer sends empty buffers and receives full buffers. Producer sends full buffers and receives empty buffers. That's how the message passing is designed for the consumer producer producer consumer problem. Okay. Of course, you may wonder where is the data, how the data is shared, and etc. Data is not shared. Uh, all these messages are put into buffers, and these buffers are copied over the network. And each layer of the network structure is responsible for making these copies, making sure that the data is transferred in a correct way, in a healthy way, the data is um, valid, and etc. Any questions? So the, the, the main difference between all the things that I told you for the last three, four lectures and this message passing is up to now we assume that there is some shared data, whether it is in the user space or the kernel space. With the message passing, since our computers are on different nodes, we don't assume any shared data. So we keep copying the data over the network. Good. Okay. Any questions? No? Then I am setting a new topic about the threads and the processes. Scheduling. Up to now, we did not talk about the scheduling. Okay. We, okay, we said that uh, there are, there are uh, more than one processes or threads running on my CPU at the same time, seemingly that way. Uh, uh, and uh, what would happen if they share data, if they need to communicate with each other, what happens with the inter-process communication stuff, race condition, etc. Now we are going to talk about who is going to use CPU when. Okay. Suppose there are several processes are runnable. They are in the ready state and our scheduler has to select one of them. Which process would you pick? Okay. That's called the task of scheduling. Which process should I run next if many of them are available, uh, if many of them are ready, in ready state? That's called the scheduling, and we are going to look at this scheduling problem right now, okay? It used to be very easy at the beginning in 1950s, beginning of 1960s maybe, because you had the batch systems, there is no scheduling because the computer can run only a single program at the same time run. So who makes a decision who is going to run next? Of course, the operator. Operator makes a decision. Operator says that I am going to run this person's program right now because I am going to load the tape from that per person. Okay. So there, is, there was no scheduler. The scheduler was the operator himself or herself, okay? When the new systems, like I said, time sharing and multi-programming systems uh, started to show up, then we have this scheduling problem, okay? Especially if we have the time sharing systems. What's the time sharing system? There are many users, people using the same computer and each one, each one would think that they are running their own, they are running their own, uh, uh, they are using their own computer, right? That's called the time sharing, okay? With the time sharing systems, if you have batch processes, and if you have the regular user processes, the idea is to give priority to the time sharing uh, requests, okay? Or the user requests short time sharing user request, okay? 
It is still done today. If you have interactive requests, if you have interactive processes or threads, you try to give them the priority because people are kind of impatient. They always expect their uh, processes to run quickly. Whenever I hit one button, I like to see some kind of a response. That's how the human psychology works. And, uh, and since uh, most of the time computers are used by the people, in order to keep them happy, okay, we usually give priority to the interactive processes. Uh, if they are ready, they need to run. We can always make uh, the batch processes wait. Okay, uh, so let me go over this picture and after that I will stop. Let's say I have two processes, process A and process B. As you see, the process A runs very uh, for a long amount of time, long CPU burst. So it doesn't get blocked. That means that it doesn't need any help from the operating system. It is doing some kind of a calculation. It doesn't make any system calls. It doesn't read any data from the IO devices. It doesn't write to the screen or anything like that. Okay, so it runs for a long amount of time. Then it waits for its data. Then it runs again, waits for a small amount of time and runs again. So these kind of processes are called CPU bound processes. They like to use the CPU for a long amount of time. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the, the types of processes uh, shown in B, they run for a very small amount of time and they wait for an output or input. They are waiting for something. Then for a small amount of time and they are waiting for something too. Okay, again. So these are called I.O. bound processes. I.O. bound processes. Which process do you like better, A or B? Depends on what I need. It depends on what you need. Yeah, that's the, the, exactly. I mean, we don't get to you don't get to choose the process types. Okay, some processes behave this way. Interactive ones, especially. Okay, interactive ones. They need interaction. They need input from the user. They behave this way. Some processes, for example, somebody is calculating a, a, a scientific model, a finite element model. Their behavior is like that, okay? They do lots of thinking and they output something, okay? So we don't get to choose saying that, okay, we like these better, write your program this way or that way, okay? It depends on your needs. So as a scheduler, it is your job to schedule this kind of stuff. So which one would you give more priority to? Which one would you assign more priority? And why? Now the problem if you go to the long CPU burst that the computer would be more frozen for longer time. So maybe the shorter ones? Yeah. The, well, since this one is kind of interactive one, what did we say? We assign more priorities, better priorities, higher priorities to the interactive processes. That's that's one thing, okay, that's one thing. But what if this one is not interactive? This one is not interactive. Both of them are, let's say, batch processes. There is no interaction. Which one would you assign more priority, A or B? Or it doesn't matter. If, if the process is interactive, yeah, definitely be. But if they are not interactive, if both of them are batch processes, which one would you give more priority? I would say it doesn't matter. Any other I idea? Think a, I what? think A because switch case is uh, less. Uh, you are saying that uh, if I assign more priority to A, since it switches less, I wouldn't waste 
the CPU time. That's what uh, Ebru yes. says. That's one way to look at it. But you have to do the switching anyway. I mean, you have to switch from this one to that one, right? You have to do the switching anyway. I mean, this, this one has to run. This one has to do all the stuff. Yeah, that's one way of looking at But usually, if you have a process like that, you assign more priority. Why? Because in a given amount of time, 100, let's say, 100 milliseconds, this one is going to take 60 milliseconds of that 100 millisecond. How about this one? This one is going to take at most maybe 20 milliseconds of that 100 milliseconds so to be fair between these two processes i would assign more prior to the, this one why because this one if if this one has more priority then maybe i can increase this 25 to 20 to 25 or 30. so to to be fair between these two processes uh, usually we would assign more priority to the IO bound processes. IO bound process. That doesn't mean that we are wasting CPU time. No, because if a process is blocked, it is blocked. We are talking about if both of them are ready, which one would you choose? I would choose B because that that is more fair. It is not the fault of process B that it is that way. The task is ta task is required that way. Okay. So B is going to be my choice. But again, it depends on what you are trying to do. Are you trying to save CPU time? Are you trying to save, uh, are you trying to be more uh, fair? Okay. Uh, are you trying to be uh, favoring the interactivity, etc. So the scheduling depends these kind of criteria. And these kind of criteria depends on your operating system. Are you a batch operating system? Are you an interactive operating system? Are you a real time operating system? So these, these kind of criteria come into play and we are going to see it that way tomorrow. I think I'm going to start today. Okay, that's it for today. Tomorrow I will start from this point and we will continue. Okay, see you tomorrow. Please study, read the chapter, rest of the chapter number two. I will try to finish up uh, tomorrow. And if you have any questions about the whole chapter, you may ask it tomorrow. Sure, but in English. Uh, we will uh, have midterm, but when? We, you said in the first week, uh, it's 19th uh, April. Yeah, so let's talk about it next week. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we are planning to do it in the the seventh week of the semester, maybe eighth week. But I think I like to cover a little bit more stuff in the second, third chapter, chapter number three about the memory and that stuff. I think I will wait until then. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. See.